Well, welcome back to part two about Manzano Base and the environmental considerations and remediation and progress there. In this part, we're really going to be focusing on the environmental remediation efforts at the facility. Now, if you've watched part one, you know that there was pretty extensive handling of a large number of nuclear weapons at this facility, and that included dismantling and reassembly of the weapons. So nuclear material was being handled here, as well as things like solvents and laboratory reagents that can also pose environmental concerns. You might be surprised to find out that the environmental damage done at Monzano Base was actually fairly minimal, but as I said, that goes to show that it's sometimes non-obvious which sites pose the largest environmental hazards. Later on in this series, we'll look at facilities at Kirtland Air Force Base that caused very severe environmental contamination, which you really wouldn't have expected from the nature of those operations. Before we start talking about kind of individual locations, though, I want to talk a little bit more about environmental remediation in general. There's a large number of sources of environmental contamination. Some are things that we very obviously think of as, as dangerous and potential pollutants, such as working with uranium and plutonium, materials that are used in nuclear weapons, uh, and I should note beryllium as well uh, is a major concern. Some significant sources of environmental contamination are a lot less obvious. Uh, a major source of Superfund remediation sites are dry cleaning operations, uh, which, especially back in the 50s, uh, often disposed of the solvents that they used in very unsafe ways. One of the things people often don't realize about environmental contamination is the way that contamination at one site can be a major concern uh, across a much larger area. Take Monzano Base, for example. If there were releases of radiation at Monzano Base, which there were, then why should we be worried about that? We're not at Monzano Base, I'm not, and especially you aren't, you're likely states away. There's a quote I often like to turn to from the naturalist John Murr, who said that when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. The environment is such a complex and heavily interconnected system that in practice, it's very difficult for contamination to actually stay in one place. Typically, it actually requires pretty extensive engineering in order to ensure that that happens, and even then, uh, ongoing maintenance is usually required. There's a, a variety of different pathways by which contamination can spread from the site where it was released throughout the larger area and into uh, wildlife and human populations where it can cause substantial harm. On the left here, we have sort of a conceptual view of those pathways, while on the right, we have more of a graphical one. There's quite a few pathways for contamination exposure, but I want to talk about those uh, that are really applicable in the context of Monzano Base. The first, and often one of the most severe pathways, uh, is groundwater. Any sort of contamination that's released on the ground or in the ground can often leach lower into the soil until it makes it into the groundwater. Once it reaches the groundwater, there's, there's generally something called a hydraulic gradient, which essentially all that means is uh, water tends to flow downhill and towards lower pressure, and that's true underground as well. So most of the time, the groundwater has a tendency to move in some direction towards an aquifer where it can settle in, kind of like a lake. Uh, if we look at the geology of the Monzano Base area, uh, the groundwater, somewhat surprisingly in the desert, is generally believed to be fairly shallow and flowing westward at Monzano Base. Westward means towards the Albuquerque South Valley, and means towards residential drinking water wells that feed into the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority. So that is one example of a path uh, towards human impact from this site contamination. Uh, radioactive particulates, for example, can leach down to the groundwater, they can flow with the groundwater, and then are pulled into a residential water system where humans are exposed. Another channel to contamination, which is a major concern uh, here in New Mexico, is uh, essentially via the wind. We have loose, sandy soil here, and we get very heavy winds, and that means that anything which is on the ground 
uh, and which is dry, can easily be blown by the wind, and through that route can contaminate a fairly large area, where either people directly inhale it, or, often more concerningly, it coats plants, which people then harvest and consume. So it can contaminate the uh, uh, food supply as well. There's a couple of, of methods of contamination, too, that might be uh, a little less obvious. Well, one that's quite obvious but might not come to your mind when we're talking about Manzano base is direct exposure. Any people or wildlife who are present at the contamination site um, could easily pick things up off the ground, could eat plants that have grown there. Monzano Base uh, is restricted access. As I mentioned, it's heavily fenced even today. There aren't a lot of unauthorized people wandering around, and many of the remediation sites at Monzano Base, I believe, are signed as radiation sites, which helps to keep people out. But there is wildlife in the area, and once wildlife becomes contaminated, there are some complex processes that can happen that cause that contamination to spread uh, upwards and throughout the food chain. One of the really concerning things is that certain types of contaminants, uh, for example, heavy metals, are capable of something called bioamplification. And bioamplification is basically kind of an emergent process from the food chain where a small amount of contamination in small animals can sort of add up to where large animals are fairly heavily contaminated. And that can become a problem because some of those larger animals uh, may either be game animals or may become a source of nutrients for plants which game animals consume, and now we have those contaminants working their way into the human uh, food chain once again, potentially even through livestock as well. Uh, a fourth pathway, which is often important but is not such a big deal uh, in the case of Monzano base, is actually that of vapor. Uh, a number of different contaminants, if they exist in the soil, often in, in what's called the vados zone, which is basically the area of soil which is between the surface and the water table. So that's kind of the section of dry soil. Anything which is volatile, which can like readily evaporate, can actually float up and then out of the surface in the form of vapors. And that can actually be quite hazardous to anyone located in the area. One example of sort of Vados zone vapor contamination is radon, which can be a pretty serious issue uh, in homes, including in this area where we have a lot of uranium in the ground. That's basically a daughter product from the uranium in the soil, which ends up becoming a gas, and then it floats up, and then it settles in places like basements, uh, where there isn't a lot of air circulation and there's a lot of that soil vapor getting out. Over time, we're going to look at more examples of all of these different pathways, including some where it's very complex. We'll also take a look at all of the different methods of remediation, which can be used to try to eliminate or mitigate all of these pathways. In this case, though, we're going to be focusing on Monzano Base. And what we'll find at Monzano Base is that most of the contamination situations there were fairly simple. There does not appear to have been leaching to groundwater. The main concern was windblown particles and direct exposure by humans and wildlife. And in most cases, when we have a small contaminated area and the major concern is direct exposure, the simplest method of remediation is to dig everything up and haul it away. And most often at Monzano Base, that's exactly what happened. I wanted to show you a little bit of the context uh, where we discuss a lot of these remediation situations. Uh, almost all reports because of these pathways that I've discussed will start with a lot of material which is about the, the really specific technical details of the area where the contamination exists. Uh, this is just one paragraph, the first paragraph of actually many pages of information on the geology and hydrology that came out of an environmental report about work in the area. Uh, it's sort of an interesting thing to me that often one of, the, one of the early steps in an environmental remediation project is to employ a geologist or a geotechnical engineer to determine the composition of the soil, the position of bedrock, the hyd uh, hydrology, etc. of the area, because that ends up becoming really important in understanding what the potential pathways are. And understanding those pathways allows us to, number one, know what needs to be remediated, and number two, to prioritize the site, because we can determine how direct the hazard is to environmental safety and health.
Okay, what is contaminated at Monzano Base? The first thing I want to talk about is the sewage plant. In a lot of areas, and especially at military installations, which are often originally built to be uh, quite self-sufficient, uh, a sewage plant is a big concern. The reality is that back in the 1950s, 1960s, even well into the 80s, uh, the standards that were used for the handling of sewage at small sites uh, were not up to the standards uh, that we require today for sewage processing. The small sewage plant which served the support facilities at Monzano Base is one of the environmental remediation sites. And what I have here, I apologize, this is a little hard to read, uh, is an excerpt from a report which gives a brief form of what's often called a conceptual model for the sewage treatment plant. And a conceptual model is basically laying out what the contamination is and the pathways through which it can become a hazard to safety and health. So let's take a look at this here. We're talking about Site 14, that's just an index number out of this report, Monzano Sewage Lagoon Numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4, Drying Beds, and Imhoff Tank. We're going to mention the Imhoff Tank a couple of times. An Imhoff Tank is a part of a sewage treatment process. It's basically a tank in which the sewage is placed in order to allow the uh, solids to settle out. Um, often those solids became a potential source of environmental contamination, so you'll see a whole lot of remediation sites that are former Imhoff tanks. The site description is storage impoundments, land treatment units, and a sewage treatment tank. And when it comes to the important part, the contaminants, analyses of discharge effluent to drawing beds indicated dichlorobenzene, toluene, and xylene present. Samples from liquid number one, drawing beds, and Imhoff tank indicate no significant contamination. So the contaminants of concern at this site are dichlorobenzene, toluene, and xylene. These are all examples of what are called volatile organic compounds, or VOCs. Uh, VOCs pose an environmental hazard in a few ways. One of them is that they tend to be fairly stable, so they hang around for a long time. Uh, another is that they tend to be toxic and carcinogenic. And one of the biggest issues with them right in the name is that they're volatile. And because they're volatile, they tend to be really good at spreading. Uh, for example, they can evaporate and they can become soil vapors. They can also settle, because they're often immiscible, they can settle on top of the water table and they can spread that way, which gives them a particular tendency to contaminate wells. Uh, so VOCs are a really common category of uh, contamination hazard and one that often needs to be addressed. Let's look at what they say about migration. Potential migration to soil is high and to groundwater is moderate to high because the units are unlined. Migration to surface water potential is low due to its remoteness to perennial surface water. Potential air migration is low. So they're not really concerned about this blowing around and they're not really concerned about it being carried away by surface water. That said, because it was present in unlined lagoons, there is a real risk that number one, the soil will be contaminated and number two, that that contamination will reach the groundwater, which could uh, transport it away from the site to where it can Im impact environmental safety and health. Often, the process of understanding environmental contamination at these sites is a uh, sort of one of investigation and detective work. Back in the 1950s, 60s, there were often not a lot of detailed records which were kept on environmental facilities. So reading these reports is always interesting because a lot of the information that the reports rely on often comes from things like interviewing people who worked at the site at the time who were still alive, who hopefully remember most of what went on. Investigation uh, of this sewage plant based on interviewing people, reviewing records, inspecting the site, and so on revealed a few things. One is that it's very likely that dangerous compounds were disposed of into sinks and floor drains at the support facilities, uh, which would have made their way to the sewage plant. And that likely explains the origins of those VOCs, which are thought to have been contained in the effluent. Another thing which was actually learned is that for some period of time, uh, as late as the early 80s, there was actually raw sewage, which was being disposed of into the number one lagoon. Um, so that creates uh, a greater hazard of biological uh, dangers as well, due to there having been raw sewage in the area. That said, a series of soil samples was taken throughout the sewage plant area and the effluent lagoon area in the 90s, and there was actually very little contamination found. Uh, 
The Air Force, based on that sampling, made a request that the site be closed and no longer considered remediated. The EPA actually came back and requested that further sampling be done to confirm that conclusion. Uh, that sampling has since been completed. It did confirm the original findings. And so the sewage plant site is now considered closed, meaning that uh, there either was no environmental hazard or the environmental hazard has been acceptably remediated. I wanted to give you an idea of where that sewage plant and lagoons were located. Uh, this is a contemporary aerial. The sewage plant is right here. Um, it's off a little distance away from the support area of Manzano Base. And the four kind of irregularly sized black spots next to it are the lagoons. Now, during the environmental investigation, it was actually thought that Lagoons 2 through 4 may have never been used. It certainly seems from these aerials like they're full of water. I'm not sure what the final conclusion was on whether or not they were used, but soil samples were taken. Um, so either way, those sites were investigated. Another very common source of environmental uh, contamination, especially at military sites, uh, are landfills. Once again, military sites, especially back in the mid-century, were often built to be very much independent, so they had their own sewage plant, they also had their own landfill. There's a variety of ways that these landfills could become a concern. Landfills back in that time period were not built to the same standards that they are today for the containment uh, of the hazard, and it was also very common for the military back then, and even today overseas, to perform open burning. So instead of landfilling trash proper, uh, they would actually place it in a pit and then uh, add some sort of accelerant like gasoline and then light it all on fire. Um, that can leave some problematic residues. In the case of the landfill, uh, someone investigated on site and found oily black stains and residue in the area. And in general, oily stains are something which suggests that there is likely to be some kind of hydrocarbon contamination. There's, uh, there's lubricating oil or diesel fuel or something which has soaked into the soil, and those hydrocarbons are often toxic and carcinogenic. Much like VOCs, they also tend to be pretty good, especially in their lighter distillate forms, at spreading throughout the environment uh, and causing concerns in other places. The story of the landfill, which I believe, I could be wrong about this location. Um, they actually mention in the investigation report that they had a little bit of a hard time figuring out exactly where the landfill was. Uh, I feel the same way, but I think that that area where you can kind of see, it looks like there's been some linear excavation, may have been the landfill. Um, I could be wrong about that. Soil sampling was performed at the landfill, and that soil sampling found no indication that the contaminants uh, were spreading at that site. Uh, basically the same story as the sewage treatment plant. A uh, proposal was put in uh, to close the site. The EPA requested a second round of sampling. That second round of sampling was performed, and the site was closed. So that landfill is actually uh, fully remediated now but it is probably the first of many landfills which we will be discussing in this video series, a lot of which required quite a bit more work to resolve than this one did. Another sort of less interesting uh, sort of domestic source of waste at Monzano Base was actually the garage where maintenance was done on vehicles which were used by this security team. Um, that garage, I believe, is this building right here. This photograph you'll notice is of the same area as the landfill. It's just one that I thought had a little better contrast on the uh, security garage. That security garage had some floor drains in it. Those floor drains emptied into an oil water separator, which is kind of a concrete structure in the ground that basically tries to skim the oil off the top and allow only water to drain, um, likely just into a French drain, but maybe into the sewer system. Very often, there is a concern that the oil, which was separated by those, may have leaked out into the soil. Uh, in this case, it is believed that there may be diesel fuel contamination of the area around the oil water separator that has not been thoroughly investigated yet because it's judged to be a fairly low-risk site. So there will probably be soil sampling performed in the future in order to establish uh, whether or not that is actually a concern. Now we get on to the actual nuclear aspects of environmental issues at Manzano Base. First, with the radioactive holding tanks. Um, this is an excerpt from a 93 permit application which discusses those holding tanks. As I understand it, 
many of the facilities around Monzano Base had a system of floor drains. Those floor drains were intended to contain any uh, radiation release in the event of some sort of radiation emergency inside of the facility. So picture floor drains in the bottom of a work area which emptied into a large tank. Uh, nothing out of that tank went anywhere. The plan was that once contaminated water was in the tank, they would figure out something to do with it. Interviews were performed of former employees, you can see here, which suggested that those tanks were never used. Um, that said, when some on-site investigation was performed, uh, it was found that a number of those tanks did contain some water. Now, quite possibly, that's just rainwater uh, that worked its way in, but it's important to work that kind of thing out. Often the records are really not clear. As I said, this is kind of a detective process, and some of that means just looking at things, seeing what they smell like, seeing if you can find any kind of oily film or residue. Um, and in general, any standing water in an underground tank, because underground tanks are so frequently a source of leakage of contaminants into the ground, uh, is reason for investigation. Uh, samples were taken from the tanks and from the area around the tanks, and those samples uh, seem to confirm that those tanks, which were sort of scattered around the area, were never used. Uh, so all of those tanks have actually been closed as remediation sites. Another surprisingly common source of contamination at uh, military installations is actually fire training. Now, this is a really interesting topic because you may have heard uh, some of the controversy going on right now about PFAS. Uh, PFAS is a compound which is used in fire retardant foams, especially on airfields, which is found to be carcinogenic. And because PFAS was extensively used during training, uh, there is pretty substantial PFAS contamination of the ground at a wide variety of uh, military and especially Air Force facilities. Um, and that includes Kirtland Air Force Base. That said, the Monzano fire training area was only used when Monzano was fully independent prior to the 70s, uh, and so there wasn't any PFAS used in the area. The big concern is that it was common at the time to use accelerants. Basically, they would pile up trash and then put diesel fuel on it and then light that on fire to use for training purposes, and of course some of that fuel may have leaked into the ground. This is uh, sort of a more interesting case than the last ones because it required quite a bit of investigation, and the investigation actually found something. So we can use this as an example of uh, a bit of the investigative process for these sorts of soil contamination sites. Uh, this is sort of a, a rough diagrammatic map of the fire training area, and you can see that there were actually sort of two different pits each of which contained an area of discolored soil, which, as I said, dark stains, often an indication of some kind of hydrocarbon leak. The uh, sort of points here mark where they dug holes in order to take soil samples at a lower level. Um, in this case, they, they drove holes 20 feet deep, so that's basically sort of pounding a pipe into the ground and then taking a sample out of the end of the pipe. They also used drilling equipment to go down 100 feet um, in the center, roughly, of each pit to determine how deep that contamination went. It's important to establish the exact boundaries of contamination, um, how widespread it is and how deep it goes, because that will inform your remediation strategy. The result of the remediation investigation at the fire pits was a recommendation you can see here um, that the contaminated soils be excavated and then soil vapor extraction be performed. Uh, the excavation was performed as recommended, and I believe to those exact dimensions. So a 30 by 30 foot area was dug three feet deep, and all of the soil which remo was removed from it was transported to a hazardous waste disposal facility where it was treated as hazardous waste uh, and basically disposed of and contained in a secure way where it couldn't spread further into the environment. Soil vapor extraction is something we'll probably talk uh, about quite a bit later on. Um, soil vapor extraction basically entails, uh, if you can imagine, sort of vacuuming up any vapor which is coming out of the soil and then doing something to render that vapor safe, which is often burning it or exposing it to very high heat because that destroys most VOCs, which are often one of the big soil vapor concerns. 
To my knowledge, soil vapor uh, extraction has not actually been performed at this site. Uh, I'm not sure if later investigation found it to be unnecessary, or if it's something which is a low priority due to the remoteness of the site and so hasn't been funded yet. Um, but at least that excavation was in fact performed. Finally, uh, for these sites, I want to get right on to the topic we've all been waiting for, I suppose, of nuclear waste. No high-level nuclear waste was handled um, at Manzano Base. Things like the pits of weapons were not disposed of there. They were removed uh, back to um, a facility like Sandia National Laboratories or the Pantex plant, and typically were basically recycled. Um, refined uranium is valuable, so it, it doesn't get thrown away, it gets reused. That said, there were two or possibly three burial areas at Monzano Base which were used for mixed waste. Now, mixed nuclear waste uh, in this case is, is essentially low-level laboratory waste. So you can imagine that in the workshops at Monzano Base, they were using a lot of things like tools, uh, wipes, swabs, things like aprons and masks all of which got some amount of radioactive particulates on them and are now slightly radioactive. The dominant practice at the time was to take that kind of material and simply bury it. Um, pretty much all of the nuclear weapons complex sites were burying this kind of mixed waste. Uh, it is a huge environmental remediation challenge today, especially at Los Alamos where the problem is particularly widespread. Fortunately, at Monzano Base, the burial areas were pretty small. Um, this burial area that, that we're looking at here, it's this fenced area right in the middle. And I should mention too, you've probably noticed that many of these sites were fenced even way back when. Uh, fencing a site is often one of the simplest uh, environmental mitigation methods that you can take. Because one of the concerns is direct exposure to humans or wildlife, uh, just putting a fence up around it, it's sort of the least you can do. It clearly doesn't entirely prohibit direct exposure, but it does reduce the number of people and wildlife on this site. This is a, f uh, this is a trench which uh, was used to bury these kind of metal boxes that they placed that waste in. So the disposal method was to put it in a metal box, stack those metal boxes up in a trench, and then eventually bury the whole thing. What's kind of funny about this burial site and the other sites at Monzano Base is that it seems to have been kind of accidentally remediated in a way. The remediation report mentions that there is evidence that before the facility was merged into Kirtland Air Force Base, and actually in 1965, the Army Corps of Engineers actually excavated these burial pits and then transported the mixed waste that they contained to a more central location. Uh, there don't seem to have been any clear records of that, so an investigation was performed, and that does seem to have been the case. Um, there were pits present in each of the sites that sort of matched the shape of the trench. No residual radiation was found, and so the remedial recommendation which was made was actually just to fill in the pits with clean uh, fill, because um, maybe one of the most basic environmental hazards you can have is that if you leave a pit, someone might fall into it and break their leg. Uh, and I believe that work was completed. These pits have been filled in so that they're no longer uh, open excavations, and it was basically as simple as that. So that's pretty much complete coverage of the environmental sites at Monzano Base. I think you might be surprised, like I was, that, frankly, this was sort of boring. There weren't a lot of complex remediation situations at Monzano Base. We'll look later on at sites at Kirtland Air Force Base where the situation is uh, quite a bit more severe and is requiring much heavier intervention. In fact, I think the next video that I make will be discussing the jet fuel release at Kirtland Air Force Base, which in my opinion, and I, I think actually in the opinion of the Air Force Office of the Civil Engineer as well, is the most severe environmental hazard which currently exists at the facility. Uh, and that was just a result of airfield operations. It has nothing to do with the nuclear weapons work there at all. Before I end the video, though, I want to just dig a little more into what's going on at Monzano Base today. I mentioned that uh, the nuclear mission at Monzano Base more or less ended in 1992. Um, when I was looking into things, I found a, a blog that was kind of comical. They were, they were, you know, reading some reports, a couple of which I read that mentioned that Many facilities at Monsanto have been reused, and I think sort of took that as evidence of some sort of deep government conspiracy. Uh, 
Well, many of the facilities at Monzano Base have been reused, and it's sort of interesting, but it's maybe not quite as big of a conspiracy as you might think. After Monzano Base was closed in 1992, the whole thing was transferred uh, actually to the control of the Phillips Laboratory. The Phillips Laboratory was sort of a directed energy weapon research group, which today is just part of the Air Force Research Laboratory um, Directed Energy Directorate, I think it's called, um, which is located at Kirtland Air Force Base uh, still today. And the Phillips Laboratory, or I should say AFRL today, does use parts of the facility, but uh, they really didn't need the whole thing. And so it's in a lot of ways just sort of been treated as excess space that has been kind of up for grabs for whoever has a use for it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Sandia National Laboratories does currently hold a permit to use seven of the vaults for the storage of mixed radioactive waste and some other nuclear materials. Those are uh, New Mexico Environment Department Hazardous Waste Act permits. They have actually applied to remove two of those vaults from the permit, so they're cutting that down to five. Uh, I have also found evidence that there were some other nuclear materials that at least at points were stored there, potentially some higher level waste, um, like spent fuel from one of the research reactors at Sandia. That said, that information came from uh, an anti-nuclear weapons activist group. I don't necessarily want to impugn their integrity. I'm just not sure where they got that information. And, you know, they have a certain ulterior motive. So I take that with a grain of salt. But it may be the case that some high-level material was handled on the site as well. Uh, it's also fairly well known that Sandia uses many of the vaults for miscellaneous storage. For a time after closure, the facility was used for the storage of classified materials. So classified documents, classified objects. Uh, I think the vaults were just a handy um, high security spot to stash them. Uh, that said, Monzano Base, I think, really just doesn't meet the requirements today for the storage of classified matter, and there wasn't a lot of desire to upgrade it and pay for the security force and etc. to be able to do that. So, uh, at least according to Sandia, they no longer use the site for uh, classified storage, but instead just for sort of boring miscellaneous storage. Um, literally, I've, I've read that office furniture is the contents of uh, a number of the vaults there. There are some pretty interesting tenants uh, at Monzano Base today. So this is a present-day uh, aerial image of the support area for Monzano Base. So this is where there were things like housing, uh, recreation, commissary, uh, just sort of basic support facilities for the individuals who worked there. Um, this is all quite active today because it is now in the campus of the Department of Energy National Training Center. Uh, you can look at their website uh, to learn more about that. I think it's ntc.doe.gov. But as I understand it, uh, security forces for nuclear weapons complex facilities um, and for civilian nuclear power plants um, actually come here for uh, tactical and emergency training, which is given directly by the Department of Energy. So that has kind of kept this campus very much in use today. This sort of uh, auto track looking thing next to it um, is uh, fairly new. Um, it's much newer than the rest of Monzano Base. And just in this aerial, um, if you zoom in, there's like a, looks like a semi-tractor and trailer there. I'm not totally sure um, what that's for, but I have sort of speculated that it may be used for some sort of testing or training for the uh, safeguards transporter. I believe it's called semi-truck. Uh, th that's just speculation on my part, but it, it does look like it's basically a a test track or a training track for some sort of vehicle. Something else kind of interesting uh, at Monzano Base, down in the southwest corner today is this facility. Um, a number of these buildings are original. Um, I think basically this whole area dates back to Monzano Base, but these ray domes do not. Uh, once again, I'm not sure what this facility is. The funny thing is that the Army Corps of Engineers posted on their website as a result of like a photography contest, this very nice ground level photo of those two ray domes. Um, you can see the, the you know, Monzano base mountain itself behind them. Uh, and right here, I think is actually, this is an entrance to a type D vault. Uh, they didn't say anything about what this was. They just said two ray domes. Um, I think it might be a satellite ground station, but that's just sort of speculation uh, on my part. 
Monzano Base continues to be surrounded by a variety of uh, research and logistics facilities between the Air Force and the nuclear weapons complex today. But one of the things that's changed a great deal about Monzano Base since the 1950s isn't just how close it is to populated areas. Um, the Four Hills community of Albuquerque reaches very close to Monzano Base. There's even some private, a few private residences uh, down in this area. And that's something that's likely to discourage uh, any future nuclear use of the area. And that is just on top of the presumably very high retrofit costs to uh, really upgrade the Monzano base to modern standards for safety and security. So in a lot of ways, I think uh, this probably is the end of the story for the Monzano base. It'll probably continue to receive miscellaneous use for storage and is open space to build new facilities, but the vaults, I think, for the large part, are just going to stay there. Uh, it's probably just too costly to either modernize or remove them. So Albuquerque is going to have a neighbor uh, that's a, a strange, secret, hollowed-out government mountain, uh, likely for decades to come. So that's it about Monzano Base. Uh, as I said, I think the next video that I make, I'm going to talk about the jet fuel uh, plume, which is currently extending from the flight line um, into residential parts of Albuquerque and posing a hazard to the residential water supply. Uh, the remediation efforts in place there are quite a bit more complex, so that's going to be a great opportunity to talk a lot more about the hydrogeology aspect of how groundwater flows and how that spreads contaminants, and also the methods and technology that can be used to investigate and address that kind of spread. So we'll be digging a lot more into the environmental aspect there. That said, I hope you found this material uh, on Monzano Base interesting. Uh, it's got a fascinating history. It has a surprisingly not so fascinating uh, environmental remediation status. Um, but I think it's one of the most prominent and important Cold War landmarks uh, in the Albuquerque area. Right up there with Trestle in terms of a site which I really hope will one day be declared a historic district and gain some sort of public access. Well, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed.